Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin and prepare our hearts today. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. And Lord, I just pray that you would be with us as your people here today as we gather together that we would just be overcome by your goodness, that we would be overcome by your grace and we would not be ashamed to sing the song of hope that you have put on our lips. Lord, let your spirit make the scriptures come alive to us today that we could leave here changed because we have been in your presence and it is your work that is going on in this place. Fill us, equip us, nourish us to go on without discouragement. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, this is a weird section to preach. I just want to tell you, because it's Paul's argument why he shouldn't get paid for his work. And so, as I was prepping this, I was like, should I pray that they take this to heart? No. (laughs) But the main thing we want to focus on today is choosing to serve the Lord our God willingly. We want to talk about understanding our rights as Christians rightly so that we know what kind of rights we have to give up what can we abandon of our own rights so that scripture and the spread of the gospel is not hindered that was paul's big concern everything that he did how can i get out of the way so that the spread of the gospel is not hindered well let's get right into it let's read and let's talk together paul says 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen our Lord Jesus Christ? Are you not my work in the Lord? Am I not an apostle? If I am not an apostle to others, at least I am to you, because you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. My defense to those who examine me is this. Don't we have the right to eat and drink? Don't we have the right to be accompanied by a believing wife like the other apostles, the Lord's brothers, and Cephas? Or do only Barnabas and I have no right to refrain from working? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat its fruit? Or who shepherds a flock and does not drink the milk of the flock? Am I saying this from a human perspective? Doesn't the law also say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it treads out grain. Is God really concerned about oxen? Isn't it he really saying it for our sake? Yes, this is written for our sake, because he who plows ought to plow in hope, and he who threshes should thresh in hope of sharing the crop. If we have sown spiritual things for you, is it too much if we reap material benefits for you? If others have this right to receive benefits from you, don't we even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right. Instead, we endure everything so that we will not hinder the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that those who perform the temple services eat the food from the temple? And those who serve at the altar share in the offerings of the altar? In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should earn their living by the gospel. For my part, I have used none of these rights, nor have I written these things that they may be applied in my case. For it would be better for me to die than for anyone to deprive me of my boast. For I preach the gospel. If I preach the gospel, I have no reason to boast because I am compelled to preach. And woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if unwillingly, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? To preach the gospel and to offer it free of charge and not make full use of my rights in the gospel. Wow. Okay, I would rather die than be deprived 
You know, it's interesting in the, in the Greek, his sentence breaks off right there. He says, it would be better for me to die than let no one deprive me of this boast, is how the Greek goes. And we have this idea that Paul is so adamant. But I kind of have a pre-point that I'd like to make before we get into the application of these verses here is that this passage is a reminder of our need for context, the context of Scripture. Uh, We're reminded that we never in Scripture can take just a selection because if we read this, and I just read to you verses 1 through 14 as an appeal for material benefit for preaching the gospel, it would sound really solid. He makes some absolutely knockout points for why ministers ought to get paid from Scripture, from the circumstances of the world. But then we have 15 to 18, and we have to contend with those. We would get the wrong idea. Remember, every verse belongs to a chapter, Every chapter belongs to a book, and every book belongs to the Bible as a whole. And we are responsible for knowing the whole counsel of God. We also remember that we need to have both a breadth and a depth of our knowledge of scriptures. While it's great to drill down into a verse or even a word, and that can bear fruit, I'm thinking of like, The word for prayer that the Greek uses, prosukomai is the Greek word. And it has this almost a military context of forcefully advancing your desires in front of God. It's a really cool word that they use. And it reminds us we're forward-facing, face forward. Am I making some kind of noise here, Jessica? Why is it doing that? I don't know. I don't know why these things happen. But, and then that eukomai is presenting your, your wish or your desire. So that's a cool word. We can drill down into that. But we must never abandon delighting in the whole ocean of God's word for the sake of examining a single fish. And so that's our reminder today. As we read this, it's important. Context is critical. And that's something that I put a burden on you as the church to do. If if ever I preach and you say, hey, that that point made sense, but if we consider a larger context, I don't think it was valid. You guys have to be aware of these things. And in fact, that's a reason that I preach the way that I do with the chunks of scripture that I do, that we hit these things and we just don't skip, skip over them because they're odd or weird. And so... If you ever wonder why does he hit these things that don't seem to apply or don't matter, well, we're just trying to get the full counsel of God. And if you stick with me for a lifetime, maybe we'll get through this whole thing. So Paul had a Corinthian problem. It's our first point. What is he doing in this letter suddenly shifting to the matter of material support? It seems just out of the blue. And why would he make such a strong case for it only to turn around and say, but that's not what I want. Don't misunderstand. I don't want your money. His problem was that he did not receive pay and he began to think, they began to think that he was unworthy of their respect. His other problem that he had was he did not seem knowledgeable enough to them or eloquent enough them he just had one message christ and him crucified he deliberately dumbed down his speech so that the power of god would be on display there would be no other thing taking precedence we talked in sunday school about the holy spirit and leaving room for the holy spirit and what that would look like if we just simply got out of the way And so he had to make an argument from a human standpoint to say, don't misunderstand what I'm doing. I am totally and completely worthy to be 100% supported by you. That's not why I'm not receiving pay. I'm receiving pay so that I can get out of the way of the gospel. 
Beyond that, they seem to be challenging his role as their apostle, the one God sent to them. And he says, look, if I'm not an apostle to anybody else, at least I am to you, because if I wasn't your apostle, what are you doing being a church? Because I founded you. Your whole existence is in question if I am in question. So he has to remind them of these things. And we know that this letter does not resolve this issue because he has a painful visit that he makes. He has a painful letter that he writes. And he follows up with 2 Corinthians, which he's still mad at them. Just go read 2 Corinthians 11. He is fuming, furious, because these guys just don't get the point. How do we avoid this in our modern day context? I'm coming down here to get a tissue because I'm about to start leaking. How do we avoid this in our modern day context? Well, it's really important that we come to church not with ears that are desiring to be tickled or that our own personal desires would be scratched. I am really frustrated that that keeps making noise. I apologize for being distracted, guys. And we have to come into this place seeking God's word and seeking to understand him and him alone. Do you have as a church an obligation to prepare yourself to come before the Lord? We know that there's there's days when you come to church and maybe you just aren't feeling it. Maybe you just don't feel like it. Boy, I confess the three of us when we came up here this morning to rehearse, our spirit was about like the weather outside. But by the grace of God, he lifts us up and he gives us the encouragement. But we have to seek, we have to pray, we have to come and desire. We have to desire to know God more than anything or else we're going to end up like the Corinthians. Boy, I've, I've on, watched on YouTube recently some really interesting ch- church antics in larger churches. Pastors jumping on big trampolines, riding around on wrecking balls, almost shooting themselves out of cannons, zip lining from the back of the church to the front. It's really cool. You're like, my church ceiling's not big enough. I wouldn't get very far. But why do they do that? It's because they want you to be entertained. They want the church to be engaged. And they want folks to come because it delights and it thrills And that's great. I don't want people to come to church and say, wow, what a boring and horrendous experience I had. I'm so excited to go back because it was just the worst. It's part of our our suffering for the Lord. But what we really want is to come and to experience the power of God and to say, it doesn't matter what was happening here. God's Spirit moved in my heart, and that thrilled, and that delighted me because His presence was real. And so Paul is establishing his rights so that he can better let them know exactly why he goes about giving them up. And that's something that we as Christians need to do. We need to establish what our rights are so that we know exactly what we can give up. So, consider verse 12 again. It says, Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right. Instead, we endure everything so that we will not hinder the gospel. This is something for us Christians to consider today. Before we can effectively give up anything for the Lord, we must first have a very firm grasp of what our rights are in the Lord so we can make an informed decision. Perhaps you think you are giving something up only to find that it was forbidden in the first place. Say, oh, I'll sacrifice this for God. And God is saying, actually, you couldn't do that to begin with. You're just coming in line with me. I'm going to switch If it keeps doing it, 
then we'll just uh, just suffer. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> And, uh, you know, or perhaps we think we want to give something up only to find that we're not supposed to give it up. Just in our previous section, Paul talked about husbands and wives not depriving each other except by mutual consent and only then for a time. If a spouse thought they were going to give up something, it might have been wrong. So we have to know what our rights are. Romans 14 has a great discourse on this. And. If you'll bear with me, I really want to just read Romans chapter 14 with you. If you have your scriptures, go ahead and flip there. It's 23 verses, but I think it bears so perfectly on our context. I just want to read it together. Romans 14. Accept anyone who is weak in the faith, but don't argue about disputed matters. One person believes that he may eat anything, while one who is weak eats only vegetables. One who eats must not look down on one who does not eat. And one who does not eat must not judge one who does, because God has accepted him. Who are you to judge another's household servant? Before his own Lord he stands and or falls, and he will stand because the Lord is able to make him stand. One person judges one day to be more important than another day. Someone else judges every day to be the same. Let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. Whoever observes the day observes it to the honor of the Lord. Whoever eats, eats for the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. And whoever does not eat, it is for the Lord that he does not eat. And he gives thanks to God. For none of us live for himself, and no one dies for himself. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Jesus Christ died and returned to life for this, that he might be Lord over both the dead and the living. But you, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me, and every tongue will give praise to God. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us no longer judge one another. Instead, decide never to put a stumbling block or pitfall in the way of your brother or sister. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. Still, To someone who considers a thing to be unclean, to that one it is unclean. For if your brother or sister is hurt by what you eat, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy by what you eat someone for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good be slandered. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever serves Christ in this way is acceptable to God and receives human approval. So then let us pursue and promote peace in what builds up one another. Do not tear down God's work because of food. Everything is clean, but it is wrong to make someone fall by what he eats. It is good. It is a good thing not to eat meat or to drink wine or do anything that makes your brother or sister stumble. Whatever you believe about these things, Keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But whoever doubts stands condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith. And everything that is not from faith is sin. It's a longer passage, but it makes the point perfectly. Whatever right I have, which is really extensive liberty, I have a great right to do what I want, to eat what I want, to drink what I want. Nothing food or drink wise is prohibited to me unless it causes you hardship. If it causes you to stumble, then I am commanded to put it away because what a grievous sin it would be for me to exercise my rights and cause you to stumble, to cause somebody to not see the glory of God because there was something that I wanted to do. 
So whether we give things up voluntarily or whether we're under a compulsion to do so, everything we do should not hinder the gospel, but rather should give glory to God. And it would be better if we choose to serve willingly. I don't think any of us is going to have a Jonah-esque experience. Like, you're not going to go down the road and, like, I don't know, what would a modern-day context would, like, a semi engulf you and drive you off somewhere? That would be pretty exciting. In which God forcibly causes you to go where he wants. God wants you to choose him and to make choices that glorify his name. Paul struggled with this, and he understood that in his case, God had placed a compulsion on him. You know, he says, if I preach under compulsion, what's my reward? I'm just doing what I have to. I'm just doing what I have to do. And I don't think that meant he was forced to, but rather something like Jeremiah. When Jeremiah tried to quit being a prophet, and he said, it, the word just burned in my bones. I had to. I had to get it out because I had this message from God. And he simply had to get it out. Since Paul had this compulsion, he knew that he was not entitled to any reward. He was simply discharging his responsibility. Just like the parable of the servant that Jesus told. Jesus tells a story. He says, imagine there's a servant out there working in the field. And when he comes in, does his master say, hey, have a seat. Let me serve you. No, the master says, I'm ready to eat. So make me a meal. You can eat later. And when it's all said and done, should that servant expect a good job? No. The servant should say, I'm simply a servant. I've only done my duty. That's not an encouraging parable, but it's a reality of our situation of whatever I do, whatever responsibility I discharge as a Christian, I have simply done my responsibility to God. If God chooses to give me a reward because I have done that, he is all the greater for it. If he does not choose to give me a reward for that, how can I complain? He's given me already the best reward that could ever happen. I have eternal life. It's coming. So what more could I ask for? But along the way, he chooses to give us good gifts. He says, you can have joy even in hardship. You can have peace even in trials. That's pretty neat. That's pretty remarkable. There's lots of times that Scripture reminds us that we have a choice. Deuteronomy 30.15, Moses said, See, I have set before you life and prosperity, death and adversity. Would make a good choice, people. I, and he says later, I encourage you to choose life. Joshua 24.15, he says to the people, Choose for yourselves today, which you will worship. God or these pagan gods of the land you're going to. Choose wisely. 1 Samuel 8, 18. The people have been crying out for a king. And he says, but when that day comes, you will cry out for the king you've chosen for yourselves, but the Lord won't answer you on that day. You will cry out because of the king you've chosen, but the Lord won't answer you because you made a bad choice. Isaiah 1, 18 to 20. I just want to read this one. This, this is my favorite. Come, let us settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they are crimson red, they will be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And then all the New Testament is nothing but an illustration of the ultimate choice that we have to make. Choose for Jesus or choose against him. There's no gray area. We are choosing for him or we have chosen against him. Scripture lays out these choices for us very clearly 
And when we hear of these consequences that the Israelites went to, it's not that God was forcing them into a choice, but rather showing them the consequences of what choosing against him looks like. In this matter of our rights, we are called to make a good choice for the Lord. And that may mean willingly giving up our rights so that we can focus on what really matters. Advancing the eternal kingdom. For what account is it if we give up little things that someone might experience eternal joy? Well, again, this is certainly an odd passage to preach as someone who does actually make my living from the gospel. And it makes me think about my relationship both with the church and with the resources the church blesses me with and my family with. You know, the big takeaways here are that we can never make a judgment on a minister because of eloquence or charm or charisma. Personally, we must be willing to give up our rights, and so we have to understand what our rights are in the gospel so that we can advance that same thing willingly. The Lord loves a cheerful giver in money, time, and possessions, and as much as our rights so that we do not become a stumbling block. And so, church, I encourage you this week to let us go forth and to live our lives in service to others and to proclaim the gospel in word and deed to a dark and desperate world. Amen.